Good morning, afternoon, live on Super Bowl Sunday. We are doing it as dedicated people, man. I was thinking about that driving over here, Craig. I was like, man, how many people on a Super Bowl Sunday are going to go to work and dedicate ourselves to creating content and good, good stuff for the listening public? You, you suppose many people working today? I'm sure there are, man. People who are, uh, you know, running their own show are probably getting after it somewhere. Actually, my son is working today. Well, there <laughs> you go, go, right there. He's going two to ten tonight. He is not happy about it either. He's like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Like, nobody's going to be getting a car wash today. Oh, is it, he works at a car wash? Yeah. Till 10 p.m.? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Long day on a Super Bowl Sunday. That's interesting. So another expedition? expedition? Is this an edition? It's an episode, an edition. Ah, of Through a Therapist's Eyes. You are Craig Graves. I'm Chris Gazdick, where we look at the world through the lens of a mental health and substance abuse therapist to create emotional growth with you. Be aware it's not delivery of therapy services in any way. Feedback and discussion on ThroughAtherapistSize.com. Mr. Craig Graves, the human emotional experience. What shall we do? Figure it out together. Yeah, man. So this is kind of a cool one. Um, I had actually thought we did one on functional alcoholism, but I, I looked through and I don't, I don't think we did. We did ha- not. We? No, no, we have not. We blew up the myth of, of imposter syndrome or n- not really the myth, but sort of went into that. Uh, this is a really cool show in that I think uh, this is a very widely used term. And get this, Craig. This is the, uh, I think it's the first, not really, but sort of, because I talk to my clients and stuff, and, you know, we talk about the show a little bit, because they can get good information on the show, and then we really personalize it. It really makes my sessions very productive using it that way, but um, this was a very specific uh, listener-requested show. Um, I honestly can't remember if it came through an email or, or just verbal conversation or whatever, but um, want to point out to the audience that man, yeah, definitely, man. When you have a topic or a thought, get, give us an email, and give us a shout out, and uh, we'll work the topic in because we we cover the gambit on mental health and substance abuse, and there's there's lots of things that apply, and I, I do try to make our shows so that they kind of apply to everybody because in some level, form or another, even if you don't have addiction issues yourself, you're going to know somebody, and you might have a family member or a friend, and. This term functional alcoholic is one that I want to destroy okay. today. Destroy. All right. I'm interested. Yeah. How you feeling, Mr. Graves? Um, well, if I'm being real, I'm a little under the weather. You can probably hear it in my voice. I'm trying to bite off a bug for a couple of days. So apologies in advance for the raspy voice and any coughs or whatever might happen during today's recording. Makes you sound cool, man. Ah, don't feel cool. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm glad you're feeling a little bit better. I know we're uh, kind of recording on on this day because we put it off a little bit to, to give you some time to recover. So seriously, buddy, I hope you feel uh, better. I don't know what your brain is able to do, but I thought, man, let's let's warm us up, man. Let's, let's let the, the, the one and only Mr. Coach himself, Craig Graves, tell us what is addiction once again from your brain as it's developing through the time. Uh, how would you characterize it? I'm, everybody knows we've talked about it, but just warm us up. Have we talked about what it is? I mean, I guess we have. Oh, it's yes. like, you know, you can't function without the drug or the whatever you're addicted to. I guess there's only, I guess some of my assumptions about addiction have kind of been torn down. There's only certain types of addiction, drug addiction, um, gambling addiction, sex addiction. I think there's another one I'm leaving out, right? Uh, online gaming. Gaming, yeah. Competitive gaming. I mean, people are on yeah, 18, but I mean, 19 people, people hours a day. are unable to function. They have to have whatever they're addicted to and can't carry on normal activities of daily life. I didn't put it on our show notes because we have had several on this topic, but most recently, episodes 65 and 66, really part one with sex addiction was really a lot about you know, what is addiction? I mean, we really dove into that with uh, Mr. Josh Shea. Hope you're out there, buddy. By the way, he's become a friend of the show. Uh, and then episode 64, Addiction and Family Dynamics. But along the lines of what you were just saying, Craig, we need, really need to point out Dr. Weigel's shows, wherever that was. Just scroll down. You'll find them. Social media and, 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 um, and, and, and addiction. And gaming, was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, gaming addiction, yeah. 
So <clears throat> we've definitely covered it, and um, it, it has, Craig. It's it's been a little bit of a, an enjoyable experience seeing your um, progression, so to speak, in what this is and what this what this isn't. Um, so that's been this has been neat for me to watch, and and like I said, teaches me what people are thinking about this in a way because I think you're you're playing off of a lot of your life experiences, just conversations with friends and what's in society about it. So it's, it's, it's really cool for me to, to hear that and talk with you about it and then see the progression of some of the things you picked up. Mm. It's kind of neat. A lot to learn. So what do you think about functional addiction? I've already tipped my hand. What's your hand? Well, you know, when I think about that term, I think about somebody who can function day to day, but still has to have that fix. So I have heard stories about people who drink or who have drank like throughout the day, like people in companies, you know, wake up and have a drink before they go to work, yeah. maybe have a bottle in their desk. They're kind of nip on, <laughs> literally they nip on all day. And then they end up in the bar that night after work, you know, and, and then that, that repeats. Right. You know, I had a friend who told me a story about a man in his hometown and I think the guy didn't remember the last five years of his life or something crazy like that because he had just been drinking, you know. If wow. you'd see him out somewhere, you'd think he was fine. Well, I could do you one better, too. I, I, it's, it's been many years ago, so I don't think anybody that knows me would uh, be able to know who this is. So I feel confident being able to say it. It's, it's literally been many years ago. But uh, <laughs> someone told me how, you know, a therapist himself, he was in recovery, so... But before he got into recovery, he's sitting there drink, drinking Gatorade and vodka all day doing doing therapy. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, you know, I've, I've heard those stories, man. Yeah. I don't know anybody like that. I guess I'm not sure how much this transitions over into other forms of addiction. But, you know, I shared recently that my cousin um, OD'd on heroin. Yeah. And functional comes to my mind when I think about him because he worked hard. He had a good job. He never missed work. He's a little lovely person i mean just a big personality everybody loved him you know he was an encourager and we had no idea he was doing this and uh and it killed him yeah i mean that's powerful man yeah and, and that's why i mean off the get-go here it, that's not functional guys i mean that that's why i just i know it's a strong word but i i hate the term i, I really do because I guess we'll get into it here in a little bit, but primarily, man, what people are talking about with this this word that's made it into our culture is, you know, somebody that has an alcohol or drug problem that's killing them and killing their lives. It, it, they have a work and and they're and they're still married. That's that's essentially all it means. Well, I think there's a the, the, the functional thing comes into the to the fact that most of the people I know who are addicted to whatever, whether it's alcohol or, or drugs are like way out there, man. They don't work. They, they, they steal, they lie, they cheat. They, you know, they're thieves and, and you don't want to be around that person at all. Whereas my other example, you wanted to be around this guy, Yeah, you know, and, and he, he, you wanted to be around him, man, you know, and he would, he would offer to stay at work late. You know, but he's the only person that I've ever known that's been addicted who's able to do that. The rest of my addict friends or whatever, they don't even have jobs, man. Yeah. Here's the thing with that. They, they a lot do, like m m many, 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 many do. The, the thing of it is, is the nature of progression that we see with addiction. It, it starts out very, very mild. It, 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 it is not... Uh, very observable. I mean, minuscule. If you if you know what you're looking for, you can catch it very early on. But e even so far as uh, I, I call it the why in the road, when people begin to experiment as a child, you know, a lot of times you'll get drug histories and you'll find it starts at 13, 14, by the way. And that's pretty young. So that's an indicator. But, you know, 15, 17, 18 years old, you start getting into the party scene and you go to college and you definitely get into the party scene and you get all this energy and activity into drugs, pot, pills, alcohol. You know, let me stay up and do an all nighter and all this kind of it's just crazy, you know. But the why in the road that I see very much is that people sort of just continue into that. They're, 
you know, on the five, six, seven year graduation plan for a four year degree and maybe even get into grad school, but they're still partying and they're, they, they kind of just keep on with that drive onward through marriage and early years of raising kids. They, 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 that, that stays a big part of their life. Other people's kind of like, dude, I'm a sophomore in college. I need to get my grades together. I want to I start getting bank. I want paid. And they get themselves like, okay, I had my fun, quote unquote, sowed my wild oats. And they, and they clean up. I mean, you know, they still might drink a, you know, a six pack when they're watching the game with their newlywed wife or whatever, but they're not throwing back and, and being generally irresponsible. Mm. Right. It's, 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 there's, there's a clear divergence that kind of happens in that slow type of progressive path that we see sometimes. And, and then, then when you're young and on that bad path, I mean, you're still married and you still have a job and you're raising your kids and you kind of look like you're living life. And that's where the functional alcoholism kind of resides. And, and, and they seem kind of cool and fun and friendly and responsible and they're raising kids, but, Behind closed doors, you'd never know it. You, you just, you'd never see it. And that's moving from like mild addiction issues to moderate. And then when you're in that moderate, you can roll for a little while. But eventually, it absolutely catches up to you and becomes painfully obvious in obvious ways. Well, that's an interesting thing you just said. So is there a scale of addiction? So like moderate, mild, just off the chart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh, okay. Yeah, ab- literally. Uh, we'll, we'll talk here about DSM a little bit. You know, because we we used to diagnose it, you know, alcohol dependence, uh, mild, moderate, or severe. And when you're in the severe category, I mean, you are stealing TVs. I mean, you're you're just you're a mess, and anybody in the world can diagnose you. Mm-hmm. It's so obvious. But when you're in the moderate, not so, not really so. Moderate to severe, it begins becoming real obvious. But moderate to mild, eh, you can't tell. You just, you just, you're, you're kind of along for the ride and, uh, you know, it, it sucks to know them and be close to them because you see it happening. It's like a, it's like a slow train wreck that just progresses. It's, it's terrible. It really is. So really, instead of functional, it's like, it's more like a scale and you're just on the moderate end of that maybe. Right. Hmm. I think so. I think so. And what sucks is, I mean, you know, it's more moderate, I would say more moderate to mild when you get. You know, people begin to getting into harder drugs even, and you can die from an instant, you know, an instant overdose or whatever. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we see that too. Yeah. Well, shoot. I mean, we see on college campuses all the time, guys. People, people do what's called alcohol poisoning, which is a, we probably need to do a whole show on alcohol poisoning because it's not really poisoning. It's just basically overdosing on alcohol mm-hmm. to the point that you shut your brain down so much. You anesthetize yourself. You stop breathing. We see that happen. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, arguably, that might happen with you know, non-addicted college students that are just dangerously drinking, but there's, oh, I'm, I'm there's sure signs. that it does, man. Yeah. Yeah. Bum, it, bumming yeah, beers yeah, and yeah, chugging yeah, liquor, bought, you know, <laughs> chugging liquor and My God, stupid yeah. stuff. Right. Right. Well, let me dial us in a little bit. Boy, our conversations are awesome. They just go, which, which, which is fine. But, but, but let's, let's get in there a little bit with, um, uh, what we, what we want to do today with, um, Covering a little DSM stuff, and then I want to spend a lot of time on why I really refute the term functional alcoholic. Yeah, remind us what DSM means. Yep. And then I want to end up on, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you identify alcoholism sort of early on? I thought that was a neat thing that I did with this. Uh, DSM is our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's a yeah, big right. old book yeah. of everything. <laughs> it's got everything in there. It's this big, thick, boring read with research in it and statistics and criterion for every diagnosis that we go by and um yeah i still pull it out from time to time when i need to refresh and look at what what am i looking at here with this client what criterion kind of fit uh what differential diagnosis are we looking at maybe i mean it's it's a it's, a, it's our bible got it quote unquote so um we're going to keep our conversation to just alcohol uh today and, and that's because it just simplifies it and and, and it, it gives us a way to understand addiction and instead of looking at the gambit of all the different things that people get into across addiction and i mean it's a dynamic field man there's so much so let's just let's just let's just dumb it down a little bit simplify it we're just going to talk about alcohol today, all right period um so there's an article by the way uh mr graves I, I sent you a link just now on the dsm i don't have it on the show notes can you get that email and we would definitely want to have that in because 
I just kind of did a quick review here before the mics came on and found this cool uh, website that, that, that went through DSM-3 and DSM-4 and our current DSM-5. And it, I think people will enjoy it. It's a pretty it. neat, pretty neat uh, site. This comes from good old WebMD. WebMD is pretty cool, man. I like those guys. Um, some people seem to be just fine, even though they abuse alcohol. Experts call these people functional or high-functioning alcoholics. I'll say, not this expert, if that's what I am, an expert. <laughs> I hate the term, man. Hate it. Why do you hate it? We'll get to it. I, it just, it, it, it bothers me. It, it really bothers me. So when I refute it, here in a little while. I'm interested to hear you. Yeah. To, you're totally charged right uh, now. It, so yeah, yeah. It, it's because it because it, it kills people. Bottom line, it it kills people. Uh, is what I might say in short. So you can still be one of the uh, one, even though you have a great quote unquote outside life. They say on WebMD with a job that pays well, home, family, friendships, and social bonds. Sarah Allen Benton, a licensed mental health counselor and author of Understanding the High Functioning Alcoholic. I think this is a quote. Although it's now officially called alcohol use disorder, you'll still hear a lot of people talking about alcoholism or alcohol abuse. It's a condition that ranges from mild, moderate to severe, and it's all still problem drinking, even if you think it's mild. So, I, listen, I, I'm not saying anything about Miss Benton. I'm sure she's a good clinician, probably. She sounds like she's well thought through and well written. I think just like... Uh, Craig, we use the term, you know, I'm addiction and whatnot. Poor guy, he's coughing over here. <laughs> you gonna be all right, man? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be good. I hope, I hope nobody heard that. <laughs> uh, I think you should just leave the mic on. Let it be real, man. No, just leave it on and roll with blow it. Anybody's eardrums out. Anyway, they, you know, they. Um, I think I was over at your house. We were hanging out, Craig, and I said I was talking about it, and I said, "Man, I'm addicted to something or other." Didn't I say that? You remember that reason? I don't remember that. It was, I think it was. Might have been fight night, and uh, anyway, I mean, people people say this, and so I'm sure she kind of says this, and high functioning alcoholic, and you know, understanding all of this, it, it, we kind of fall into society's use of mental health words sometimes. I think as professionals, and and I think it's important that we learn that we're careful, particularly when we're having professional conversations with terms like that. Um, so I just I don't know, qualify that a little bit. Um. Basically, definitions really revolve, like I said, around that before, you know, maintaining jobs and relationships. Um, you know, my transition point to blowing up the myth would be about all the other criterion that we look for. I mean, you know, if, if, if you look at the DSM, we have several criterion that we're looking for. Yeah, jobs and relationships are a part of it. But listen to this list here in a second. That, that we're looking at so much more than those two things. I mean, somebody can have those two things together and have six other criteria and actually have a freaking serious problem. But the term functional alcoholic, because we look primarily at working relationships, you know, doesn't consider all those other criteria. That's, that's, and that's a serious problem, I feel like. Um... Yeah, in the DSM-4, man, I think we got it right, and we, we reverted back and screwed it up. <laughs> Whoever makes those decisions. We used to call it alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence, mild, moderate, and severe, and now they just clumped it all together and called it alcohol use disorder. Sounds like too much time trying to figure out what to call things. It, yeah. And actually what to do about them, maybe. Yeah. That's a... <laughs> Say more about that. That's an excellent thought. Well, I mean, you know, we talked about <laughs> Asperger's versus autism spectrum and what to call different things, and now we're talking about what to call functional alcoholism. Is it functional alcoholism, or is it alcohol use disorder, or what? What is, what is it? Why not quit worrying about what to call it? <laughs> Figure out how to treat it. Because insurance wants paid. Yeah, that's in a whole other story, I guess. It really is. It's it's some of this stuff is silliness with 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 some of the aspects we have in the healthcare industry. Mm. It's uh, troublesome to say the least. So we had similar criteria. In, uh, this article actually pointed out something interesting because I, I I feel like I've worked been working with addiction. I don't I don't think about it quite so much in this way, but very specifically, uh, where did I see it in this article? DSM five, our new criterion, added craving as a specific criterion. And I thought that was, I, I frankly, I did not, kind of embarrassing to admit that, but I did not realize that fully. I mean, it's. 
What, that craving is a part of it? That's a, that, no, not that it's a part of it. I mean, I'm always doing my assessment, and I'm asking about, you know, blackouts and cr- cravings and preoccupation and, you know, all the characteristics that go along with, with addiction. So, I mean, you know, as a matter of fact, I mean, early on in my career, I wondered why is this not a part of the criterion? Why is this not a part of the criterion? And this one, and it wasn't. So if somebody's craving, <laughs> if somebody comes in your office and says, man, I'm craving a drink, that's, that's a signal? It used to be, yeah. It used to be well. They won't. They don't usually recognize it as that. Uh, cravings are they're kind of confusing. P- people get pretty confused on what what that is. Hmm. Um, but but um, anyway, I, I think I lost my train of thought. So craving is now something that's actually a formally a part of the the diagnosis. I, I thought that was interesting. That I flat out honestly didn't even realize. To be honest with you, that's terrible to admit. I just took a, I just took a leap of genuine genuineness, Mister Graves. <laughs> what do you think about that? I think it's good, man. They also eliminated in DSM five the uh, illegal problem as a criterion. I'm gonna have to look at that closer and see what the heck. Well, I guess I just read so this it is DSM five. This is the fifth yep. version of this thing. Yep, yep, yep. And so they added cravings and took away legal problems. Evidently, which is silly to me. I mean. If you have a legal problem associated to your drinking, that's going to be something as a clinician I am going to make a note of. Well, that could be part of it for sure, yes. but it's not a. It's, I mean, I might get drunk tonight and go go get a, a drunk driving ticket. Doesn't mean I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, but that's one criterion. We're looking for five of the ten or whatever, five of the seven, mm. and that's one of the things. Okay, you know, and 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 to say so, that what do you do? Do you say okay, you meet three of the five, you're, you're a you're an alcoholic? Essentially. I mean, that, that's, really? the way, that's, well, that's the way we do with all criterions. Uh, because, Craig, you got to understand, in, in the mental health field, when we're doing diagnosing, I think we talked about it on our diagnostic show. You, we don't have blood tests, man. I can't, I can't, you know, sit you down and look at you under a microscope and see the gene or, you know, see something in your blood. Like with all of them, bipolar. We can't do that. Mm. We don't have the technology. And uh, and a lot of a lot of medical diagnosis you might not realize they're they're doing the same thing. Oh no, I get it. I you mean, know, you, you know, can't always what are your take symptoms, your... and this is why we, what we're going to do to treat it. This is what you got. I I get that completely. And that's the exact same thing. The trouble is, some medical diagnosis they look for the molecule in your blood, and they can say that we we don't we yeah. have none of that. Well, if 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 addiction is a genetic disorder, then at some point we'll be able to do that. I think so, and I'm fascinated. About that. As a matter of fact, I think I told you, uh, Neil deGrasse, you know, the astrophysicist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love him. He's awesome. He was, uh, he was asked the question, what is the most interesting or dynamic scientific question in today's day and age? And the, 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 the questioner suggested, is it, is it, you know, the origin of the universe or the black holes and, and, and what happens at the event horizon or something like that specific? He's like, no, 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 not none of that. He said, what is happening in research in neurochemistry, the finest subparticles in your brain and the synapses and, and, and the genetic realities? He says, at some point, I believe, this is Neil deGrasse, paraphrased, that we will be able to sort of nip and tuck the brain so that you will never have to sit down with your psychiatrist because we'll just be able to straighten the little neurochemistry out. That's possible. <laughs> yeah, that's very possible. Yeah, I, I thought that was a big statement. It's too far out there, to be honest with you. I, you, th- you don't? I don't think it's too far out there, no. I mean, I think that... Uh, I think a lot of wacky stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> Put a number on it. How many years are we going to be able to... I, don't know how long, I have no idea where they are in research, but I, but I, mean, I mean, if we're genetically programmed to, to, for the outcomes that we're, that we're spitting out, then... And all that code's in there somewhere. Where they're already breaking down DNA and fifty years. I don't know. Hundred and fifty. Maybe years? maybe not fifty. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where the research is, but I do know that. I, I do know that 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 you know if we are indeed programmed for cholesterol. Yeah. Blood pressure. Yeah. Oh man, uh, AVM. Uh, you know, it's it, because your DNA or you have genes doesn't mean you're going to get something. There's a lot of factors right. that play into what causes the gene to be turned on. And, uh, right. you know, if we find the Alzheimer gene, perhaps we can turn it off with some kind of treatment somehow. I don't want to say drug because I'm not a drug guy, but 
maybe there's some kind of something out there that can turn that thing off. Lasers. Or on. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows, man? <laughs> uh, let's go here. DSM-5. This is what I guess they're kind of listing here in this article. Uh, it's not scholarly. It's just off of, uh, well, it's pretty cool. It's a, you know, NIH government. Uh, it's a government kind of thing from National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and, and Alcoholism. So it's, uh, that's, a, that's actually a really good source. Um, <clears throat> Spit through this super fast. DSM-5, in the past year, have you had times when you end up drinking more or longer than you intended? More than once wanted to cut down or stop drinking and tried to but couldn't. Spent a lot of time drinking or being sick of getting over other, uh, what is this called? After after effects. Is after effects one word? To have it is one word right there. I don't think that's right, but continue. <laughs> Typo! <laughs> Wanted a drink so badly you couldn't think of anything else? Uh, found that drinking or being sick from drinking often interfered with taking care of your home or family or caused job troubles or school problems? Continue to drink even though it was causing trouble with you, with your family or friends. Given up or cut back on activities that were important or interesting to you or gave you pleasure in order to drink. More than once gotten into situations while or after drinking that increased your chance of getting hurt, such as driving, swimming, machinery, walking in dangerous areas, or having unsafe sex. Continue to drink even though it was making you feel depressed or anxious or adding to another health problem or after having had a memory blackout. Had to drink more than you did once you got the effect you want or found that your, unu- or your usual number of drinks had much less effect than before. And lastly, found that when the effects of alcohol were wearing off, you had withdrawal symptoms such as trouble sleeping, shakiness, restlessness, nausea, sweating, racing heart, or seizure. So you breezed through that pretty quick there. But yeah. how, many, how many questions was that? Eleven. 11 questions. So how many do I have to answer yes to for you to say, okay? They say here the severity of alcohol use disorder is defined as mild, the presence of two to three symptoms, moderate, the presence of four to five symptoms, severe, the presence of six or more symptoms. Okay, so if I'm Joe Listener and you go through that list and I say, okay, well, I'm two or three or I'm five to six, I mean, could they assume that? They are potentially on that scale somewhere. I mean, I guess the answer to that's obvious. Go see a professional. Oh. Really? Okay. Because they're they're, and I'm not saying I'm saying that <clears throat> for the for this reason. It, 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 it's hard to assess yourself for anything, honestly. Medical doctors go to other doctors to get assessed because you are not clear. You are not objective. You're you're not seeing yourself, so you can have a sense. <clears throat> I would say, honestly, if you have even the, the slightest of sense or one or two people in your life that said, hey, yo, Craig, dude, you need to chill with the, the whole thing there. You, you, you're, hitting that, you know, you're hitting that Jack Daniels a little too hard, man. If, if anything like that is, you just go get checked out. Just go assess it. And I've had people in my office do that, Craig. I've, I've, I've absolutely had people who sit down with me and say, listen, Chris, I'm not sure. This is what makes me think I might have an issue here or problem. I don't know. Maybe I need to stop. I'm, I'm not... I'm really not sure. And then we spend time to go through and really assess that because it is, it is so simple when I read a list mm. and say, this is, not a, this is not an internet game. This is not a little survey. This is, this is a life disorder that, mm. that affects people. So, yeah, do, please don't listen to a list like that. I'm glad you said that and, and, and try to assess that. Go, go get it assessed. And so if I'm on the moderate scale, if I'm, if I'm hearing you and I say, oh, I, I got a couple of those, but, you know, I'll be all right. I'm, a, I'm good. You know, I'm tough. Yeah. I'm assuming that you could progress down the line. Down the, uh, you could progress is what I'm saying. Hear this clearly. Six months, you know, you got more. And Hear- then in 12 months, you're off the rails. Hear this very clearly. If you have addiction, it will progress. That's it. We, we see that. So. Joe Listener, you're answering yes to some of these questions. One. One. Even one. All right, go back. Pay attention. Go back and read them again. Well, I'm going to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, they can, they can check the show notes. The reason why I say that is because these things in your relationship with alcohol, I, I, I'll, I'll correct myself and say two, you know, they're, they're indications of something's not right. This isn't like, 
you know, later on in the show, I'll, I'll kind of point out the things that are kind of good indicators that I've kind of yeah, but, come but across. But how, how much of that do you have to use your own personal judgment to? Because like my mother, here's a story about my mom. My mom never drank, maybe a couple times in her whole life, and she's close to 70 now. So she goes to a party with my father at a, a company party and decides she's going to have a drink. Well, one led to two, two led to three. Next thing you know, she's completely hammered and she's, you know, she's sick. He had, my dad has to take her home and she's sick. Right. She could answer yes to some of those questions. Not really. But she's never, I mean, she's obviously not on that scale. That's why I say if you've got questions and whatnot, go to a professional because that would quickly be rolled out. Okay. Qu- quickly. I, I mean, that would take mind, me five minutes. There's probably some common sense too, right? It's a one-off. I, I think so. Okay. It, 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 that would take me five seconds, Craig. I mean, five minutes. I mean, that, that's... That is not the characterization of even one of these criteria. They're involved and they're, they're depthy. Got it. Yeah. And, and again, the combination of multiples of these different things that we look for is, is really where you start seeing the danger signs. And yeah, stuff for sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's say they come to you and I say, you know, Chris, I'm craving, I'm craving the good whiskey, man. And sometimes I have a drink and it leads to 12 or whatever. And, you know, and you say, oh, Craig, OK, Craig, you do got a problem. What are my next treatment steps? Is it a 12-step program, or do I continue to come and see you? What's the, what's the deal there? Mm. How can I be briefer with that? There's a whole continuum of treatment with addiction, as simple as go to 12-step free and in the public non-formal uh, therapy experience, which is what I do, individual outpatient therapy. I've met with people a couple times a week, even in the early stages of dealing with abstinence and sobriety. Groups, treatment groups. A lot of times you get it in DUI programs, 20, 40, 60, 80 hour treatment groups. A lot of times they're called classes. They're therapy groups. You have intensive outpatient programs where you go three times a week, sometimes four times a week, two to three hours each pop. Mm. They're designed to prevent you from having to go to rehabs or as a step down from going to rehabs. And then, then you got the granddaddy of, of, of the 30-day programs you know, that everybody thinks about as rehab. But then you even have more involved things like halfway houses and places where people will live in programs for six months, eight months, mm-hmm. as long as they need to kind of get their life together. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a whole continuum. Okay. So is it possible that, you know, I, I self-diagnose, so I'm drinking every, I come home from work, have a couple of whiskeys before bed, you know, on the weekends I'm partying, you know, and then I say, dang, man, you just, you got to get, you got to get this thing together, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm not really an alcoholic and I start going to AA or, and then I give credit to the 12-step program for fixing my issue. When I never really had an issue to begin with. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that happens, right? And people are, I mean, yeah, it's impossible should to I know. Start out, should people start out with a professional first to make sure that they actually have, do have a problem? Oh, that's an interesting question. I guess I've talked today like that would be a definite yes. I, you know, uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the different 12-step programs are, you know, they're celebrate recovery in churches systems for, for more of a Christian perspective. There, there's different things that are out there. But I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that gets me very, very concerned, though, Craig, that people get into a back and forth with throughout the course of their life over several years is the idea that I have an alcohol problem and I'm going to try to return to controlled use. That's dangerous because yeah, but some people just walk away cold turkey, right? Yeah. I mean, you always hear Uncle Bob did that. He put down the bottle and never drank again. I'd, yeah, you know, great. I mean, I had, I'm that's awesome. That's not typical though. As much as everybody knows somebody did, that's not typical mm-hmm. from what I see uh, and, and what I have experienced. Well, obviously, they come to you. They got. They can't do that. Right? Say what? I said, obviously, if you're seeing them, they can't do that. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, so you're like, hey, I, I quit drinking, Chris. Just came in here to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> For the first time, first session, just thought yeah. I'd assess it. Don't need any know. help down the road. I'm just saying. <laughs> right. Good Gave point. Up, man. Good point. I guess I wouldn't see a lot of that. <laughs> uh, how about we take a quick break and let's talk about why I refute and hate the term functional alcoholic and then a lot of the quick little identifiers that I've kind of had in my mind over the over the years that I've seen with people. All right, what are we doing through the break, man? Let's highlight Metrolina Psychotherapy Associates, the sponsoring agency of Metro or of uh, Through a Therapist Size. They're in Mount Holly now. Phone number 704 
461-8253 for outpatient mental health services. And uh, the Through a Therapist Eyes website, Craig, what you got on that? Through a Therapist Eyes.com, there is a link on there, a little graphic image you can click on that will take you to a company that sells 126 high quality health supplements. Everything from hormone creams to CBD oils to nutritional supplements to sleep aids, lots of great stuff out there on that website. Make sure you go to our site first, though, doatherapistize.com, and click on the graphic. I hate the term functional alcoholic. Let's destroy it. Cool with that? <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me like, oh, Chris, I don't know what to do with that, man. <laughs> Are you sharp today, man? <laughs> got nothing. Got nothing for you. <laughs> that was funny. That's why we need to be on a camera, Mr. Graves. <sighs> so <clears throat> I need to lose weight before we get on the camera on the YouTube thing. Not do I have or been able to keep relationships, but rather what is the effect on the person really related to specifically my relationship with alcohol? Do I have or have I been able to keep relationships? This is, this is something that people think about. Same thing with the work. You know, it, it's, you really got to look at your relationship with alcohol, not your relationships with people. I mean, it's 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 just you. It's in your head. It's in your heart. It's in your life and and how you're operational in your life inside of you. Alcohol is ripping apart. It's destroying shame and guilt and all sorts of terrible internal. It, it's just it's such a battle. I mean, you can keep a marriage and a relationship going, but the level of deceit and distrust, and you know that it's there, and your spouse generally does too. But you can stay married. But man, I mean, you're hiding alcohol in in the barn out back. Like, that's not a relationship. That you might be able to stay married. That's not functional. It drives me nuts. Well, I mean, that's I think that, that makes me think that's not a real relationship, right? right? I mean, you're staying, you're using the term staying married, yeah, mm -hmm. but I'm not really loving my wife or my husband or my kids like I should be because I'm consumed with this addiction to alcohol that I have. But your neighbors would look at you and think, oh man, he's got a well kept lawn and well, they probably goes do to work that anyway, and... you know. <laughs> do what? They probably do that anyway, you know. When, when I was going through my separation and divorce, before, before we got separated, when we were having troubles in our marriage, um, alcohol was not a factor. But people would see us and they'd say, oh, you guys have such a beautiful family and everything like that. And we'd get home and close the door, man, and it was not <laughs> nice, you know? Yeah. And um, it, just, it just wasn't. So, yeah. I mean, you, you never know. You never fully realize it. Um, and we're going to, well, let, let, so let's go on to a couple other things. So for instance, rationalizations is, is another reason that, you know, I just want to refute the functional alcohol, alcoholic term. You know, uh, the, the rationalizations are something that's a big part of what people are struggling with. And, you know, the, the whole functional alcoholic is just nothing but food for rationalizations you know people are playing this this total head game in their in their in their head you know on the right shoulder the good angel on the left shoulder the bad angel and the good angel says holy cow dude you're a mess and the bad angel says ah come on you're just we're better than everybody else see bob drinking the good this, this back and forth dialogue goes on in people's heads like it ravagingly you're, you're you're questioning do i have a problem do i not have a problem is this right is this wrong is this something to worry about is this not it is not i mean you can just it's amazing what goes on in people's heads. And so the term really just supports all these defenses. You know, putting out rationalizations. Well, see, I'm a loving husband. I got things going on. I'm, I make a lot of money. I'm wealthy. I'm not poor. I'm not poverty stricken. I'm not a brown paper bag, trashy person that's living in the street and alcoholic. It, functional alcoholic just feeds rationalizations. Yeah, but do people really call themselves that? I mean, you'd have to think you were a functional alcoholic to, to, to try to justify that stuff, right? The, the, the culture, yeah, I see your point. The, I think the cultural reality, you might not think in your head, I'm a functional alcoholic. But although I've heard people say that. I've actually heard people call themselves that. But you might not go that so far as to use the term, but, that's, but you're going to be using the thought process anyway. Like I said, 
I'm wealthy. I've got a successful business. I am a businessman. I'm not an alcoholic. That's just, you know, feeds the progression. It just feeds the denial and the ignorance that you see with, with this. Okay, I think I see where you're going. Dangerous because the third term minimizes the real problem of progression. Well, we talked about that. Early on, the problems are not the intense, but you still very much see several symptoms. Why wait until progression has really progressed? I think I hit that pretty good before, didn't I? D, family, right? They are really affected. What was the episode we just did? 64, man. Family is really torqued about all of this, and they don't know what it is and what it isn't. They just know something's not right with mommy. I I don't know what's going on, but she don't seem right. She's this and that, whatever they see intimately. That's not functional. Um, you still have the relationships and whatever, but big, bold print, you have the no-talk rule. I'm pretty sure we talked about that with the episode on family. You just learn not to bring it up. You're not going to talk to mommy about her, 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 her drinking because you learn very clearly that's a very bad thing to do because of the defensiveness and the fight and the turmoil that comes from that. So I just won't say anything. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a real thing too. My father drank on the weekends. He, my dad was not an alcoholic. And um, I could tell you a story about that, too, that to, to, to solidify why I can say that, that confidently. But he drank on the weekends. And I remember asking him one time if he would quit drinking. Hmm. And it was not such a nice response. I never asked him that again. <laughs> ouch. <laughs> you yeah. Know? You know? It's, it's an ouch, yeah? <laughs> yeah. It was an ouch. I didn't ask him again. I mean, he, 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 he was, it was not a physical thing, but he, was, you know, he said something back to me that, Made me think that I would not ask him that question. You know the again. message very clearly. Yeah. It's it's sometimes even just a look of death. Like you don't touch that. No, okay. I you know I'm just a kid. I don't know what. You know it's scary. Yeah. It's scary. So it's it's a very powerful reality. And again, that's not functional. That's not functional. That's destructive. It's 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 a horror show when it happens. Particularly if it happens over and over again, multiple times. You might might be so bad. Dad's drinking. Might be so bad. You brave it five seven times. I mean, every single time you've learned, you know, it's not so uncertain terms. Don't do it. Performance. How about that, right? You, so you keep the job. The term functional alcoholism. I hate the term because it doesn't, it doesn't count into effect the, the, the effectiveness of performance. I mean, if you've got somebody that's drinking, coming to work hungover, they may not be busted for a blood alcohol level, although a lot of times they are. It's why I don't understand the legal problem not being a part of the criterion anymore. That's nonsense completely. You could be so much more functional if you're on your peak performance. You might be a business owner and, you know, drinking most through the day and nobody would know, but, man, you could have been making so many more sales calls. Mm -hmm. Your productivity can increase dramatically when you're feeling better. Yeah. You know? You know, um, Mickey Mantle was a famous baseball player, New York Yankees. Yeah. And, um, you know, functional alcoholic, I guess, if, since you hate the term, maybe I should call him something else. But Mantle drank a lot, and he would go out after the game and yeah. get completely hammered. Hey, Bruce, too. He'd be throwing up in the dugout the next day before <laughs> yeah. the next game started. You know, he'd, he'd hit a home run, run the bases, and throw up in the dugout <laughs> when he got back. And people say, man, if he wouldn't have been drinking so much, he could have, oh, who amazing. knows what kind of ball player he could have been, man. You, you and he was he already could. with, you know, he's already a legend. Yeah. And if he, would have, if he would have been sober, God knows what, it could, what, it, what he could have done. That's, that's your baseball history. You like that's baseball. My baseball, yeah. That's my baseball example. But yeah, man. I mean, well, you really, like baseball, so you would know the yeah. inside story of that. You know, the, the term, why do I hate the term functional alcoholism? The term supports the denial system. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on denial. We've talked about it. On past shows, remember the count the F's thing? You remember that sheet I did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an awesome thing. It's an awesome way to show the inability to see what's going on. So, but you know, the functional alcohol, alcohol term, I mean, it just absolutely perpetuates the the fact that you just can't see the F's on the page, and and it just it just it, it blocks people from gaining insight horribly. So, mm-hmm. I, I know if you listen to this show and you hadn't listened to the other ones, the count the F's thing is going to sound weird. Go back to the episode. You'll see what that is. In addiction talk, they speak of the yets. All right, the yets. This hasn't happened yet. 
the story of one young man that I met in West Virginia needs to be told because I was a green uh, clinician knowing very little. And part of our training, you know, I went to these these 12 step meetings to learn the program and stuff. And one particular dude stuck out of my brain, man, Craig, he was he was this cool baseball cap wearing mountaineer dude. A really fun, loving, nice fella. And uh, he, he liked to smile, it seemed like. I saw him in the meeting several times because I went weekly for you know, my, my whole school semester. And uh, he was only 19 years old. And he was a full-blown alcoholic in his own identification, fully engaged in the 12-step program. And he just, like, laughed a little bit. I was talking to him one day. He's like, man, he's like, Chris, I haven't experienced half the things he's experienced. And thankfully, I've gotten into recovery a hell of a lot earlier than they ever did. And I'm never going to have to experience those things as God granted I'm walking the other day sober. He's like, I, I, I got a lot of yets. <laughs> a lot of yets. And I thought, man, that's a cool way of thinking about it. Mm-hmm. This, this dude was able to really recognize this and get sober so early in life. It was, it was just awesome, man. So be aware. There's, you, know, you might have a lot of things that hadn't happened to you yet in your relationship with alcohol and drugs, but it just hadn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. But, but, but keep drinking. It will, more than likely. Mm. If you have addiction. If you don't, different story. Bottom line, there's just so much more to look at than are you employed and am I still married? That's, that's just not enough to, to really determine what, what's going on in my relationship with, with alcohol. Drugs, pop pills, alcohol addictions, drug addictions, eating addictions, gambling addictions, sex addictions. And online video gaming addictions, just as a quick review. We're just talking about alcohol today, though. You know, I think that I hear what you're saying about the term, and, you want, and I understand why you don't like it. I'm not trying to change your thinking. But for me, that term maybe is putting somebody on the scale. You know, here's a guy who is an alcoholic, but he's not the guy that's lying, cheating, robbing, stealing the, to support his habit. He's able to at least appear like to those around us that he's able to carry on his daily activities. I think you're right. And I don't know her. I have no idea. But Sarah Allen Benton, the licensed mental health counselor that was a part of that WebMD article or whatever, I, I'm, I'm almost positive that's where her brain is. I, I think you're, you're right on. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. I just think it's unhelpful part of our cultural lingo that has – been a part of our vernacular. I, well, I think we were poking fun at the system earlier about about the terms we argue over these terms. So perhaps you know you think about it like mild, moderate, and so you level one, level two. So functional is level one. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so he's a level one alcoholic. You yeah, know, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Absolutely. No, I, that's that's that is the thing, and, and and that's fine, and I don't begrudge that concept because that that is what it is. It's mild, moderate, and severe. That's I think we started out the show talking about, you know, moderate to mild. You, you know, you're, you're going to be living life. You're going to be rolling and rocking and rolling and doing your thing. You know, but boy, you start hitting moderate. You start hitting moderate to severe. <laughs> it ain't pretty. And the thing, if you remember when past shows, you remember how long it takes to progress, they say? Mm. So, so they say that this issue of addiction ends in jails, institutions, or death. Oh, yeah. I remember talking right. about that. So I don't two, remember how long, though. Two to 25 years is what has always kind of been the quote for men. 25 years. I'm not sure I've heard us say that before. Yeah, man, think about it. I mean, addiction kind of kicks in, you know, somewhere around 17, 18, 19 years old. Let's just call it 20 for the easy math. You're you're 45, pushing 50 years old before it really is a mess. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, mm Mm-hmm. I'm looking. I'm looking ahead on the notes here. This is this this next part's going to be cool. So if you think you might have some alcoholic tendencies. Pay attention. So let me let me tell you what this is. Yeah. So this is the this is sort of the 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 how of it. How do you identify it? I mean, I, I think when I went down through this, I was doing good ones, and then I got some more good ones at the end. And I, and I said in the middle, I, I think I started to just you know brainstorm this stuff, and I thought, man, some of these are probably going to be too. Uh, I don't know what, how, to, how too too integral that that you really need to process out with some of them. But some of them are like, you know, I've kind of said, you know, this, these are strong signs of 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 there being an alcohol problem. Uh, so yeah, let's let's go down through them. Uh, you know, and 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 I guess maybe to qualify this too. Um well, I wrote it down at the end. I'm going to say it at the beginning and the end. I'm going to read what I wrote. Okay. If you're wondering if you have been called out, chances are 
Go get it assessed. Many times in therapy, I've started a therapy relationship with wonder. Quote, am I an alcoholic? Unquote. Not always do we all arrive at yes, but I, I can tell you oftentimes we do if people are wondering. But not always do we arrive at that. People come to my office and we really kick through this and, and we find kind of other things going on in life, you know? Um, yeah. Particularly if your crazy drinking didn't start until later on in life. I mean, if, if, if you drank like zero to three beers, to, you know, two times a month or once a week, zero to three, out, you know, and, and you've been that way for like 20, 30, 40 years and suddenly you're 50 years old and now you're drinking like a fish. That's a weird clinical picture for me. I am really going to be saying, like, what is going on here? Forty-five to fifty-five years old, man. I mean, there, something, something, you know, is 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 hitting. And it might be a PTSD thing. It might be a bipolar thing. It might be, you know, who knows? Self-medicating. Yeah. So yeah, that's a term. Yeah. Right. That's a that's an important term. Say, say more about that. What do you what do you, what do you hear there? Well, I mean, just like you know, you got PTSD or a broken heart from a relationship or you lost somebody close to you and and to escape that pain you're drinking or yeah, drugs or whatever I yeah mean, self-medicating it, drugs too yeah, yeah. It, it's your yeah you hit the nail on the head craig that the self-medicating thing is a very very real reality that mixes up with the addiction traits that we look for and that's part of what you really want to get a relationship with somebody a therapist a professional to Kind of get that looked at yeah yeah i like that idea <clears throat> if you think you're you think you potentially could be an alcoholic i, I think it's a great idea to go talk to somebody to, to figure out if you really are absolutely because that that that's a that question needs to be answered it needs to be answered yeah if it's in your head and it's spent any time in your head you need to go get it out of your head and get that question answered yeah, yeah I, I agree yeah Man, that's great advice if it's lasted more than a year I mean, you, there's no question. You need to get the question answered. Yeah. Yeah. So blackouts, this is one. So let's go down through these things. How do you identify if it might be an alcoholic? Several blackouts, man. <laughs> I mean, the first time that you have a blackout, it, 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 there are many people that have had a blackout and don't, don't have alcoholic addiction issues. Truly. So say that again. There are people who have had blackouts Absolutely. that are not alcoholics. Absolutely. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Man, this is going out around the world. I guess we're genuine on this show, right? We are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. My clients are listening. That's okay. Yeah, I remember in college, man, I absolutely had a blackout. You ever had a blackout? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For being honest, yeah, in college. I know? mean, it was like the weirdest thing, dude. I was like... <clears throat> You said I said this, and I believe the person said I said what I said, and I had Zippo, man. Nothing. Yeah. It was just flat straight not there. And and I did drink a lot that night. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was crazy. I, and, and maybe we turn the mics off. I'll give you more feeling. particulars. Yeah, maybe, we should, maybe I shouldn't tell my story <laughs> then because I got a good one too. <laughs> I cannot imagine that happening any regu- with any regularity. I mean, if that's happening regularly, because the first time you have a blackout, it takes an absolute crap ton of alcohol to make that happen. I mean, you've got to be hitting the bottle hard that mm-hmm. particular oh, night. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But the second blackout, not as much. The third blackout, by the time you get several blackouts, man, you can have that happen pretty regularly and easily. That, that's, you know, like a long-term alcoholic, they're blacking out all the time. Well, like I said earlier, I knew a guy who had a guy in his hometown, and he, the, guy, the guy cleaned up. You know, he got help and sobered up. But he literally told my friend that he didn't remember the last five years of his life. Yeah. You know? He, yeah. He drank a half gallon of vodka a day for five years, man. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and he probably, that, I mean, that sounds like super severe, honestly. He, he probably literally had a blackout most of the times he drank. Yeah. At that, I mean, at that point, I mean, the human body is amazing how much you can actually get your body geared to do what you do. Your body gets good at doing what you do. And if you drink you alcohol, think. your body gets really good at dealing with a lot of alcohol in it. You and I get a blood alcohol level of like 0.2. We are, we're the 
We're yeah, hysterical. We're, we're in that blackout state. We are. We are. No, we wouldn't be blacking out at that point, probably. But, I mean, we are, like, funny. We are stumbling. We are trashed. People can get a blood alcohol level of 0.4 and higher, Craig. You and I would be dead. We'd be dead. So, I feel like we got to move on a little bit. Um, yeah, mic's off. i got to hear that story. We'll, we'll, swap, we'll swap stories. <laughs> Uh, so multiple blackouts, you know, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good strong sign. I mean, you, you have one or two maybe, like, you know, but that is not something that typically happens. Uh, honestly, Craig, I would venture to say the vast amount of people in this world have never had a blackout. Mm. I, I hope that like 50 to 70% of our listening public just listened to that and, and thought, I don't know what that experience is. Mm. Maybe 70 hope so. Time. Yeah, I hope, yeah, I hope so. I yeah. hope people don't know what that feels like. Because <laughs> the next morning ain't fun. <laughs> no. Gosh. How many others really have concerns that care about you, you know, and, 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 and do you let them tell you is item two on this list. I mean, if you start hearing people that really care about you and they've said something to you in a serious way, man, that takes a lot for a buddy or a friend. I mean, girlfriend comes to you, sister, and she says, hey, girl, you got some things here I'm worried about. They have been thinking about that a long time before they brought that to you. If your wife is just nagging at you and busting your chops about, you know, this and that and this and that, that kind of takes a lot to confront somebody about this. So if you're hearing multiple people, that's a really good sign. Um, number three, big one here. We've talked about it on the past shows, but it, it stands to be reasoned again. Uh, control is the big, big issue with addiction. It's, it's, it's like, a, in my mind, a lot of a, a line of demarcation. Um, and the best way and the short way that I can describe what is meant by having control, because, boy, people can rationalize the crap out of that, is the idea of, of um, predictability. You and I pretty much can probably predict our events in the next week to really the next month over how much alcohol we'll consume. Any given night, we pretty much know I'm Ubering tonight, boys, you know, or uh, sure, I'll I'll drive. I'll meet you there. We'll both meet each other there. We know what's going to happen. When things start happening that you can't really have a level of predictability about, that's that's a really weird sign and and a strong like, oh, you got to stop and look. Go deeper on that. Do you mean like when I'm not planning on drinking too much and I do? What are you, what are you talking about there? Yeah. Honey, I'll be home at 10 and it's 2. And you really meant 10, but it ended up being 2. I got it. I got it. I'll be safe at driving. Then, you know, as uh, Father Martin in Substance Abuse Chalk Talk classic film says, first the man takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, then the drink takes a man. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, I, and I guess, is that also about how much you can drink? So, like, yeah. I got a bottle of, I got yeah. a great bottle of uh, Irish whiskey up in the cut cabinet. So, you and I, after the show, could, could pour a drink. The Super Bowl a, Sunday. Have a drink, and, you know, then that'd be the end of it. You'd go home. Yeah. I got other friends, man. If I open that bottle, they're going to drink the whole thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. I might have my one drink, but they're going to keep going. They can't stop. So, is that, that's like an indicator? It can that, be. That's what control's a about, too. In, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I mean, now we're not talking about impulsive behavior either. So, it doesn't mean that they are an alcoholic. I mean, that's, that's why these things do get blurry. Well, people like, you know, I used my mom as an example earlier. That was a one off. Yeah. That's... But I know guys, man, if they drink one, they're going to drink 12 or 15 or whatever it takes. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and whatever it's a it recurring t- thing Mm-mm. yeah yeah it's it's a destructive relationship at best you know for sure i mean uh you can drink a lot and not have that happen though too by the way mm-hmm. i mean it it really is a confusing murky world uh, mm-hmm. to a certain extent because they're yeah and i'm sure everybody's been out and not planned on drinking much. yeah absolutely you know, i remember going to a dirt track race over here at carolina speedway oh i love that place and we had to carry our DD out, you know, and one of the other guys had to drive home because <laughs> <laughs> the guy just, you know, he had a beer, was having a good time, and the next thing you know, he kept on and on, and the next thing you know, he wasn't driving us home, man, <laughs> yeah. with somebody else. But I mean, that, that kind of thing yeah, happens. It happens. It, absolutely. It, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's funny, in my, in my uh, scannings, uh, in, in my brain, I listed number four, legal problems, and continue drinking. I think this is why I, uh, I like I said, in the middle is I started listing things that are just symptomatic, not really the, the, good, uh, the good simple pieces. But Because um, <clears throat> what, I, what I intended by this section are like little, little things that pop in my brain when I see them with 
with people. But uh, this is this is legal problems and continued drinking. Uh, I mentioned the why in the road, uh, you know, with young adulthood uh, and, and what that looks like. Here, here's one that's actually kind of serious, though. What are we on? F, uh, the, the 40 ounce joke. Uh, but it's a serious in consideration. You have no idea what I mean by the 40 ounce joke, do you? <laughs> I, I saw that on there and was trying to figure it out, but I can't. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's a dead ringer. If you're a 40 ounce beer drinker, uh, um, 40 ounces, yeah. You, you probably have an alcohol problem. <laughs> you pro- it's one of those, if you do this, you're a redneck thing. Or you're a broke-ass college student. One of the two. <laughs> Even then, man, you think back in the college years, here's why that's actually a little bit of a serious uh, indicator and stuff, too, because I don't know about you, but have you ever bought a 40 ounce and tried to drink I, it? I, I probably have. It seems like it, I've had a 40 ounce Budweiser. Yeah. But back in the day when I was in college, you know, we were all poor college students. And my, my, my brothers, man, they would like just scrounge together enough change to buy a You're couple get a 40 ounces. You know? Yeah, well, I mean, if I you're can't sharing think it. of the beer that the, there was a 40 ouncer that was the go to 40 ounce. Oh, God. And oh, I can't not not remember, 45, man. I hope man. one of my buddies is listening. <laughs> I'm going to have to ping somebody after the show's over because now I can't remember what that is. Colt 45, baby. But it wasn't an alcoholism thing. It was a money issue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Back in those days. But if you think about it, you're probably sharing it with your buddies. I mean, you know, here's your cup. Here's my cup. We got the 40. That's great. Okay, we drink. If you're trying to drink a 40 ouncer, man, it is flat, hot, nasty by the time you're in to the 40 ounce beer. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's nasty. I want to pop a fresh cap every time I'm having a beer because, I mean, I'm just not drinking it that fast to get to the good, well, you know. It's not, you know, it's not even cold anymore. Yeah. If I have a beer now, you know, if, that's a big if because I don't drink hardly, hardly anything anymore. But that's the reason I do it. When I was in college, my motives were much different. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's just sort of indicating of the rapid drinking. We have something called gulping in assessment when we're talking to people. They're drinking faster, and they, and they don't realize it. Like, yeah. they don't even know it. Yeah. You're, you and me sitting down at a bar, and you've got your, your beer about three-quarters done, thinking of the next one, looking for the waitress, and I'm like a quarter way through. I mean, it's like, dang, man, you pounded it pretty hard there yeah. i mean you, and yeah. you don't know it you're just drinking yeah so and then the idea of the sheer amount the volume like yeah you're trying to get buzzed uh, yeah. it, it's a couple other things we partied uh thursday friday and saturday night in color back in back when i was in school and one of my buddies had a cheap wine party on a thursday night and he lived off campus in a uh in a little house <clears throat> and we actually got five gallon barrels and had fires like we were winos we were drinking Wild Irish Rose and Mad Dog 2020. Oh, God. <laughs> Dude, nobody partied the next day. No. Because everybody was just so hungover, man. <laughs> yeah. But, emo- you know, the motives were much different. Right? Exactly. Now a nice glass of red wine with my steak is awesome. Yes, yeah, sir. Back in the day, man, Mad Dog 2020. Oh, God. I- <laughs> Mad Dog. <laughs> Oh, and mine was sometimes was the ice beers. You ever have the ice things? Oh I mean, yeah, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. Ice, when those ice beers came out. What was yeah. the uh, what was the first ice beer? Uh, I don't know. I think I'm drawing but blanks I, on this stuff now. I know, man. It's yeah. so, so long ago. It's fun. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, ice beers. Wasn't it? Uh, ice. Well, maybe that was it. Ice. Ice was it? Ice house. Yeah. Well, was no, it wasn't ice house. No, it was it was ice. Gosh, that's funny. I had to Google it. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, yeah, anyway. It's, it's, we'll uh, have to just wrap back and forth about our college days. I know, right? Show. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Pattern of emotional coping with alcohol is one of the big things, and we mentioned before. Honestly, if you have a pattern of emotional coping and there's none of these other things going on, there's probably really a big life thing happened or happening, and you're not really even maybe realizing it. You're just drinking, doing the, you know, the self-medicating thing for sure. Uh, being able to quit or self-proof. That, oh, that's the thing. I mean, you know, if it, how many times have you asked yourself, you know, yeah, that's, that's actually seriously one that buzzes in my head, pun intended, right? You know, how many times have you, like, had the thought, man, I really need to get my crap together, and I need to stop this, and, and, and you stopped for a period of time. I mean, that's fine. I, I don't begrudge that. But you got to ask yourself, after you've done that two or three times, like, why am I really doing that? Why, why, what is in my head? What am I feeling? What am I sensing that causes me to stop. Mm. That, that speaks loudly in my clinician's brain when I'm sitting down with somebody trying to figure this out. Does it apply or not? Yeah. Um, there's other couple things that are interesting. You know, defensiveness and guilt. Honestly, guilt is a huge one. Like, if you tell me, and, and you need to think about it for yourself. Be honest with, a, with an assessor 
when they're asking you these questions, you know, if, if you're guilty about it, like it, you shouldn't feel like your beer is 10 pounds in your hand, you know, you're like trying to, just, oh God, you know, I don't want them to see that I got, <laughs> I mean, if you're drinking, you know, three or four beers before you go out with your buddies, just so like, uh, I just want to kind of get a head start. I don't really want them to know how much I'm drinking. Dude, that's, there's weird feelings there that's inside you that, that really does speak loudly in my head when I'm trying to, like I said, uh, assess this. Is this a supplier or is this not? Um, has alcohol been a long friend in your life cycle? Uh, I mean, over the course of your life, I mean, has is, is alcohol really been the go-to thing? It's just something to think about. This last one is a, is a really good interest, a strong one in my mind, seriously, when I'm trying to figure this out with people. Hiding places. If you've got original and creative hiding places for your, for your bottle, dude, man, who, who is putting their bottle in a weird place so that people won't know they have that in the house? That's not a clinical assessment tool in the DSM, but... It should be. That goes that, back to the guilt thing, right? Yes. You don't want people to know that you're drinking, so you're hiding it because you feel guilty. Right. Yeah. And, of course, if you're at work and you have your stash at work, you're hiding it. Dude, that's screaming to me as an assessing clinician. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of that type of stuff I may not even hear. If you're drinking at work, that's a somebody. big clue right there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That, maybe that ought to be on your list. It probably should. Drinking at work. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, you know... I mean, there's even people that work in wineries and stuff. I mean, they drink little sips and spit it out because they're like, you know, I, if I'm sipping the samples and stuff, I don't, I'm doing this professionally. I'm mm-hmm. spitting it out. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's sort of a, a long and slam run on what are some things that pop in my brain about, um, hey, this is an indicator kind of thing. Okay, if you're wondering if you have been called out, chances are go get it assessed many times in therapy. I've started a therapy relationship with wonder. Quote, am I an alcoholic? Not always do we arrive at yes, but I can say that often we do. Uh, Before and after this little section of things that pop in my brain, I do want you to go get it formally assessed if this is in your head. I think that's a great, that's great advice. I said that earlier. But I'll say it again. I think that's good advice to go get that question answered. Yeah. And then you can figure out how to deal with it if indeed you do need to deal with it. I, I really like the way you put that, Mr. Graves. So let's take us out of here. Um, what was I going to do? Oh, remember, this, this actually, this show was a listener request, a very specific listener request. So um, if you have that out there, you're listening around the world, pop us an email, contact at com. We want to listen to that. We'll fit your show topic in, and eventually we may cover it, but, you know, faster than, sooner than later, let us know. We'll do it. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's good. So, like, we do shows on various topics, marriage, parenting, and, yeah, if you, if you listeners want to hear more top, more on a specific topic, yeah, let us know. I mean, we can still continue to do other topics too, but if we can do a deep dive somewhere, then we're happy to do that for you. So take us out of here, and I'll tell you where we're going next. Um, through a com is our website. You can find out more about the show there. I have individual entries for each show. You can stream directly from the website, or you can find us just about, just about on any podcast platform, obviously, of course, including Apple. If you're enjoying the show, we'd appreciate you leaving us a five-star review and um, subscribing. And tell your friends, man, um, the best form of marketing in the world is word of mouth. If you tell your friend you really enjoy our show, chances are they're going to listen. And Chris and I, our goal is to get the word out about mental health and mental health-related issues. And you can be a big factor in helping us do that. You can find links to our Facebook and Instagram also on the website. And there's also an email newsletter there. I've been pretty slack lately about sending out emails, but I uh, would love it if you would sign up for that. And um, I think that's it, Chris. Where are, we, where are we headed next, man? So we're heading next to an interesting, I think, and a cool show. It, it, it seems a bit random, but it's actually a little bit of a lead-in show. We really have a commitment to do a really powerful show soon with our good, my personal good buddy, Aaron Clark, and he's going to be bringing his family. So... Uh, before I did this particular show prep that we're going to record, actually what is in here in a couple of minutes, 
<laughs> for you, it'll be next week. How do kids think versus feel? And and I and I and I want to go through that because we're gonna have little Zachary on the show, man. Little Zachary, Craig. He's he is uh, Cody's uh, little brother. So I yeah, I knew he was coming. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It it, it it's oh man. I, I just I don't know. I'm I'm obviously kind of tongue tied a little bit with it. So so I thought so I thought a nice lead in show to that would be like let let's get in a kid's brain and the kid's system. We haven't done a whole lot with kids and little guys, but yeah, a lot of a lot of our listeners have kids. So uh, let's let's dive into how they manage emotions and feelings and how all that works. Sounds great. <laughs> 